Uh, welcome to the first presentation in our County Parks feature series talking about North Park and Settlers Cabin Park. Uh, I'm Amy Miller and I'm the watershed specialist for the Allegheny County Conservation District. Tonight is the first of four webinars featuring our nine county parks. Uh, the dates for the remaining webinars are up there on your screen and um, if you're interested in any of those feel free to register. Uh, we'll send out a follow-up email with the, the links that you can do that with. So each session uh, will introduce each park and discuss their histories, any of those not to be missed features, and uh, some recent park improvement projects. The webinars are being recorded, uh, so they'll be posted on ACD's website and we'll share those with uh, parks so they can be viewed in the future. We'll have a question and answer session after each park's presentation, so if you have a question, you can type it in the chat box uh, at the bottom center of your screen, and either myself or uh, my coworker Rebecca will uh, make sure your question gets asked. Uh, so with us this evening, we have two of the Allegheny County Park Rangers, Elise and Deglin, and the Allegheny Park Rangers are the ambassadors for our parks, so they represent the ideas of conservation and stewardship of our natural, cultural, and recreational resources and provide park visitors with orientation and information while ensuring park regulations are being followed. The park rangers offer educational and interpretive programming, as well as outreach programming to local schools and communities uh, like this presentation tonight. So without further ado, I will turn this over to uh, Elise and Declan. Hi everyone, my name is Elise Cuffs. I am one of the Allegheny County Park Rangers, as Amy said. I'm Ranger Declan. I'm a park ranger that's stationed out of North Park in the Northern region. And we, as the park rangers, do what Amy said. Basically, we are out in the parks so that we can interact with the public answer any questions that they have, hear their concerns. We hope to make the parks the best that they can be for all of our visitors in the parks, but we do a lot of volunteer projects, land management, we do a lot of trail projects, a lot of plantings in the park, and we also do a lot of education programs. So we run public programs in all nine of our parks, but we also do a lot of outreach programs with Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, libraries, schools, senior centers. So we do a lot of many different things that relate to our county parks. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our PowerPoint for tonight. We are gonna be talking about North Park and Settlers Cabin Park. We are gonna start by discussing North Park. So if you have a question, as Amy said, feel free to type it in the chat and we can hopefully answer it for you. So the Allegheny County has nine county parks overall. Uh, North and South were the first ones to be developed and started. We also have seven regional parks that were developed in the 60s and 70s. And the thinking behind that is so that everyone has a park that is near their home. So on the map here, you can see that Settler's Cabin um, is in the southern and uh, western portion of the county. And directly above it almost on 79 is North Park which is the first one that we're going to be discussing tonight. So North Park is the largest of all the county parks. Uh, it has just over 3,000 acres, and the land was probably occupied as far back as 3,000 BCE. It is thought to be used as a short-term hunting camp, probably during autumn. First people that lived permanently in the area, we believe, were the Monongahela people. Now, they did have permanent settlements, and they were here between the years 1050 and around 1635. So later on, the land was part of what's called the depreciation lands. And there is an amazing uh, museum staffed by volunteers off of Route 8 that talks about the history of the depreciation lands. Um, but this was land that was awarded to Revolutionary War veterans as part of pavement since the dollar had depreciated uh, so low after the Revolutionary War. So land for both North Park and South Park were originally bought by E.V. Babcock. So that name might sound familiar because Babcock Boulevard is named after him. He's also the former mayor of Pittsburgh. In fact, he was the mayor during uh, the uh, pandemic of 1918, um, and he was later a county commissioner. Now, while he was a county commissioner, he had this grand idea 
of establishing what it later was called the People's Countries Club. So these are areas that people from the city could sort of get away um, and enjoy the natural environment and perhaps get in a game of golf without having to join an exclusive country club. So that is where his idea came for North and South Park. Now he personally bankrolled uh, about the first 4,000 acres that became North and South Park himself and later on uh, sold it to the county once they approved this idea of creating these two county parks, North and South. Now they were dedicated in June, 1927. And up on your screen is a picture from the uh, Sunday Post in the top right-hand corner that was actually taken on Walter Road in North Park. So if anyone's familiar where the church is at the top of Walter Road, you can see the church in that image. Uh, St. Paul's is on the left side of the picture. And then in the corner is actually um, a small white building near the American flag. You can see that, that's actually the schoolhouse. Now that was a functioning schoolhouse. Um, later on burned down and a, a rustic shelter was built right on top of it which is called the schoolhouse shelter. And you can have a picnic in that shelter even today. So uh, North Park has a lot of fantastic architecture and unique sites. One of the more famous ones that I hear about often and people ask me where it is, is the Fountain of Youth. So that's what's in the uh, top left corner of your screen. And that Fountain of Youth was um, originally uh, built in 1938. There have been a couple of repairs made to it since um, but it was built in the style of a Roman tavern. Now you can no longer drink from the Fountain of Youth inside and there's no uh, evidence that actually led to anyone being more youthful. Uh, there were some concerns about water quality and it was finally shut off in the 50s or 60s. Um, and people originally were using it to fill up some water jugs and uh, said that it was a beautiful area. It still is today. You have to cross a creek, um, but it's a, just a really unique structure that when I first drove past it, I had to do a double take and then a triple take to try to figure out what that um, interesting structure and built in the side of the hill on Coomer Road was. So if you get a chance, that's a good place to visit. Now around the same time, um, a year earlier, so in 19, uh, two years earlier, 1936, the boathouse was built. The boathouse is pictured on the right hand side of your screen and it was partially built using funding from President Roosevelt's New Deal. And that was through the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works. In both North and South Park, there's quite a few structures that were built using New Deal funding. Um, and they both had civilian conservation corps uh, camps where uh, men helped forest the area that became North and South Park in the early years of the park's establishment. Now the boathouse originally had some boats on the ground floor that you could rent out. Or if you had your own boat, you could even store it overnight for a, a small fee and you could store it over winter for a little bit of a larger fee. And they had a police station right in the first floor of the boathouse. And what's really cool is the police had a boat that they could actually launch straight from their office onto the lake. You don't see them doing that uh, often anymore. So on the second floor, there is a uh, men's and women's uh, waiting room or a bit of a, like a dressing room. Um, the men had a lounge as well, the women did not. And now that is an area that you can book out uh, for an activity or for a group of people less than 25 nowadays, uh, if you wanna hold a party at the, on the second floor of the boathouse. So it really is sort of the crown jewel of North Park. I would say it's one of the most photographed sites in all of the county parks today. Um, and it's a beautiful site. And originally it was built before there was a lake. So if you see some of the historic images um, that are available online of the boathouse, there's no lake by it because the lake was actually created during uh, the final months of the boathouse's uh, completion. Now both those two structures uh, were built in the same couple years as the pool and the pool was completed and dedicated on the same day as the lake and that was in 1937. So that's a year after the boathouse and the year before the Fountain of Youth. And originally it was one of the largest pools in North America. Is built to be able to house the Olympic trials. Uh, unfortunately, they did not finish it in time, but uh, still today, it's a very marvelous uh, feat of architecture to create a pool that, that is that large. Um, it can get quite crowded on some days. And you can see some pictures of uh, the pool where 
there's barely any water visible because they had so many people crowded in that pool on a hot day, especially in the 40s, 50s, and the 60s. So the pool, boathouse, and fountain of youth were actually all built around the same time that Henry Hornbostel was the director of the parks department. And he is a very eclectic and famous architect. He also designed the soldiers and sailors in Oakland or Rodef Shalom, if anyone is familiar with those two places in Oakland. They're grand uh, pieces of architecture that everyone uh, in the area is familiar with. And he probably had his hand in the three buildings there as well. Now, if you go to the corner in our black and white picture of Oak Dean on the bottom right hand side, this is a more traditional park structure. And there's quite a few of these built in the first three years of the park's development. Now we think Oak Dean was are built around 1930, 1931. We don't have an exact date. Uh, however, it was uh, built on the site of an old quarry. And there's now a small pond, some people call it Irwin Pond. It's right at the corner of Babcock and Pierce Mill Road. So there is a trail that leads right to it and it no longer has a roof, but all of the stones are still in place. And I'm gonna read a little bit from Paul Reese. He was our first director of the parks department and he was also a famous and a nationally known landscape architect. Uh, when he wrote about it, he said that this oven shelter with its fireplace, stone seat and crane forms a central feature and is flanked by stone tables and pergolas on either side. Its seclusion in the less accessible part has added greatly to the desirability of this splendid forested area and overcame many objections that were had on that account. So the boathouse and the pool were built to draw in large groups of people at one time. However, there are a lot of sort of hidden features in North Park that you have to seek out. They were built to be more secluded and also so you can enjoy the environment around you as well as having um, a bit of a roof over your head or having something to seek out within that walk that you're taking through our woods. So those are just a couple of the features um, that we wanted to share in North Park in terms of buildings. All of these are still around today that you can seek them out, but we're gonna talk as well of some of the more natural uh, features of North Park that you should seek out when you next visit us here at North Park. So on the top left, we have the new meadow. Now, if you were driving on uh, Pierce Mill Road and Wildwood three years ago, there is a fence right behind uh, where the Penn State Master Gardeners have their demonstration gardens. And it wasn't really a sight to see. There wasn't much to see other than some silt that was left over from clearing out the lake uh, when it was last dredged. However, now we're turning it into a meadow that at the very top um, has a mound with natural stone steps and just last week, they completed some natural benches using stone and wood. And it's a really great place to get photographs of the sunset um, or just the goings on on the lake. You can see the kayakers, you can see people running and biking um, all along the five mile lake loop trail. So it's a, it's a great place to sort of snoop out what other people are doing in the park and get some great photographs. We also have an extensive trail system in North Park. Now you can uh, figure out what trail you're on using the blaze system, which is across all nine county parks. We use colors that are in the shape of a rectangle on trees um, or on rhino markers, which are uh, just posts that are put up usually at the beginning of a trail to indicate where you're going. And we have some that go you know, through somewhat technical areas, including we have one uh, mountain biking downhill course called the Dr. J Trail. But other than the Dr. J Trail, all of our trails in all nine county parks are open to all users, which includes bikers, hikers, and equestrians. And there's a beautiful area of North Park on the Red Trail where you walk through this amazing pine forest. Um, and that pine forest was mostly planted by the Civilian Conservation Corps and a couple other New Deal programs. We also have the wetlands, which is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And the wetlands is a very short boardwalk um, but if you have young kids or someone that's not as comfortable hiking, that's an area they always recommend people check out because it takes you through the wetlands, there's interpretive signage. At the very end, um, you might end up at the Eagle's Nest Shelter, which is named that way because uh, just a couple of years ago, we had a pair of bald eagles uh, take up residence in North Park. So if you only had one thing that you wanted to seek out and you only had a little bit of time in North Park, we recommend that you check out the lake. 
So the lake has uh, some activities on it. You can rent kayaks from one of the vendors in the park. You can just walk around the five mile lake loop. You can sit and watch birds for hours. And I guarantee you there are people that do that every day in North Park. Um, and as well, you can fish. So fishing is open year round um, on North Park Lake and it's a huge draw uh, to people to come out and enjoy North Park. So now we'll hand it back over to Amy so she can share some of the projects that the Conservation District has done in North Park. Sorry, having some technical difficulties here. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, so Rebecca and I are gonna talk about two projects that we did in North Park. Um, the first is a fish habitat improvement project and the second is a riparian buffer. Um, so the North Park Fish Habitat Improvement Project uh, was installed over the three segments over the summers of 2016, 17, and 18. Um, so you can see the project is located um, along Wildwood Road. So over here on the, the left part of the screen is the lake and Babcock Boulevard. Um, the start of the, the yellow line there um, right on the municipal border um, is right across from Best Feeds. And uh, we worked downstream almost to where the county uh, maintenance uh, building is. So we skipped this section in the middle because there are some wetlands. So we had some access issues and we couldn't really get to that section. Um, there are many things that about these structures that I I think are very beneficial to the stream. So fish habitat structures utilize natural materials um, that are found in most streams, rocks and logs um, are used to enhance the existing stream channel. So fish like all living creatures require space to live and grow. Um, and that space needs to provide the things necessary for their survival. So not only do these structures provide cover for fish, but they also add oxygen to the water by creating current they improve macroinvertebrate habitat and decrease er erosion along the stream banks. Um, so to do this, the structures are designed to work with the existing stream flow um, and direct those currents back to the center of the stream and away from the stream banks. Uh, these are designed and permitted structures. Um, so the, the design and placement of fish habitat structures uh, needs to be thought out and intentional by someone who understands how water will react to the structures during both um, normal flows as well as high flows. Uh, these structures were designed by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission and they were also on site during uh, construction of the structures. Uh, so let's talk about the structures themselves. We installed three types of structures. There were log frame stone deflectors, log veins, and mud sills, which you can see on the design. The first Two types are deflectors that are designed to keep the flow in the center of the channel. Um, and they'll create a habitat um, by kind of scouring out that end at the, the tip of the, the structure. And that'll create a little pocket that fish like to live in. And also below, it kind of gets them out of the current a little bit behind the structure. The mud sill provides bank stability uh, and it's, so it, um, stabilizes the stream bank, but it also provides um, a simulation of an undercut bank. So that provides the fish with overhead cover. Um, so just to recap, the project really had three outcomes. Um, the structures are mainly to improve fish habitat, but they also provide stream bank stability as well. Um, both of these things combine to create improved fishing opportunities for the community um, where the fish are happier and healthier and 
um, will hopefully bite your line. Uh, this section of the stream is stocked by the, with trout by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission a few times throughout the year. Um, and with that, we have um, one other project that Rebecca is going to talk about, and then we'll get to your questions about North Park. Good evening. My name is Rebecca and I work in the watershed program at the Allegheny County Conservation District where I help to plant and maintain riparian buffers across the county. I'm here to talk about the riparian buffer we planted in North Park, which is located in the Pine Creek watershed. First things first, what is a riparian buffer? You may also hear the word streamside used in place of riparian. A riparian buffer is the strip of vegetation that runs alongside a waterway. This diagram is just one example of a riparian buffer. Riparian buffers can look like this, or they can come in many different combinations of plants, grasses, shrubs, and trees in different widths. Well, who cares about a strip of trees next to a stream? Riparian buffers are so important to our state that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has a goal of planting 95,000 acres of riparian buffers by 2025. Riparian buffers provide so many environmental services, including cleaning the air we breathe and the water we drink. They even help to increase the economic value of an area by enhancing the beauty of the property and, in the case of riparian buffers specifically, help to maintain the property itself. Consider if I own a home next to a stream and my property is being washed away because it does not have anything to hold it in place, which is shown here next to the uppermost house in this diagram. Riparian buffers are critical everywhere, but in Pennsylvania, we have extra responsibility to give our streams the best treatment we can because, because our state has around 85,000 miles of stream, which puts us just behind Alaska for most stream miles of all the states in the U.S. I can't talk about riparian buffers or anything having to do with improving our land and waterways without talking about watersheds. A watershed is an area of land that sheds or drains to a common point. Think shed, like a shed, a dog shedding fur, not like a shed, the place that you store shovels and lawnmowers. Watersheds are nested. A watershed can be as small as a footprint and as large as the ocean. We planted the buffer I'm going to talk about in the Pine Creek watershed, marked by the red star. Because water flows downhill, all the rain that falls and all the water that flows within that watershed boundary eventually drains into Pine Creek. Pine Creek then flows into the Allegheny River and the Allegheny River flows into the Ohio River and the Ohio River flows into the Mississippi River, ending the journey at the Gulf of Mexico. Our actions, no matter where we are, can either positively or negatively impact those downstream. Planting a riparian buffer here in the Pine Creek watershed does good right where it is and its goodness travels downstream too. Here are some examples of riparian buffers around Allegheny County. The photo of Robinson Run is another buffer we planted last year in McDonald Borough. Robinson Run actually drones, drains into Lower Chartiers Creek, another buffer stream pictured here. Imagine all the benefits provided by riparian buffers in each of these photos. Stabilizing the stream banks, cleaning the air and water, slowing stormwater and floodwater, shading and cooling the stream, providing food and habitat for aquatic and land critters, and beautifying the area. These are photos of streams around the county that do not have riparian buffers. And let's have the opposite imagina imagination exercise from the last slide. No buffer, no protection, no environmental benefits, no food or shelter for wildlife and pollinators, no benefits downstream. Now to the riparian buffer of the hour. Last April, we planted 500 native trees and shrubs over two and a half acres along Pine Creek with incredible partners and volunteers, including the Allegheny County Parks Department, municipalities in the watershed, corporate volunteer groups and community groups. By planting a puffer in the community and a county park, we know it will be valued and visited for many, many years to come. Here's a side-by-side -side of the areas that we planted and the location map. Pay this buffer a visit over time and watch it grow. As you can see, it's located near the dog park off Pierce Mill Road. We planted close to 20 different native species of trees and shrubs here like elderberry, pawpaw, witch hazel, redbud, river birch, shagler, hickory, and bottlebrush buckeye, 
by so many because diversity brings really important benefits including provi providing different types of food and habitat for pollinators, birds, wildlife, and aquatic life. Diversity is also insurance against a total wipeout. Some of you may be familiar with the invasive bug, the hemlock woolly adelgid, and may have even seen eastern hemlocks fall to it. What if we only planted eastern hemlock here and the adelgid swept through? We could potentially lose the entire buffer. Planting a riparian buffer or a tree anywhere is a long-term investment that provides increasing returns as it grows. The environmental benefits we mentioned earlier will continue to grow and the opportunity to volunteer provides a lesson that can last a lifetime and multiply the impact by more trees and yards planted by volunteers. Thanks for listening and I hope you're able to stop by the riparian buffer in North Park uh, and consider planting a couple trees in your yards if you don't live, even if you don't live next to a stream. So here ends the North Park portion of the presentation, and I'll open it up to any questions if there are any. We do have a couple questions. Um, so many comments on how interesting the talk was. Uh, and one question is, is there, a, is there some place to find the secluded shelters listed? And also, is there a map to get to them? So the, um, the historic structures that we're talking about, most of them are not on any current map. Uh, they are, if you can see most of them from some of our marked trails. And if you use the Trails app, which is free, you can use it on a smartphone or on, a, on just the website. Just search for Allegheny County Trails in whatever app store that you use. You can download that. Um, they're not rentable um, and you can still go into them if they're if they're standing. There's quite a few of them they are still sort of hidden in the woods um, off of some of our blaze trails. Okay, when hiking the trails I've noticed some are in disrepair. Are some left to go back to nature? So some of them fell out of disuse especially when uh, there is people coming to the park that are more interested in driving sort of right up to where their party's being held versus going on a half mile walk to where their birthday party is being held in, um, in sort of in the woods off of a trail. Uh, so some of them are uh, not gonna um, be fixed up. There are a couple that maybe in the future, um, depending on, on the priorities and also in what, uh, what shape they're in right now. But we're gonna talk about some of that um, in upcoming history programs. So if you're interested in learning more um, about some of those historic structures. You can join us on September 6th for a webinar, and that will be emailed out um, in a link after this, after this presentation. But you're also welcome to contact me directly, and we can put my contact information in that as well, so you can learn about some of the historic structures and maybe chat more about um, where they're located and how to get to them. Okay, so we have several questions about fishing in the lake. Um, so what type of fish are in the lake? So we have uh, quite a few different types. So there's uh, bass, crappy, bluegill, pumpkin seeds, uh, so some bullhead, uh, sunfish, catfish, carp, and there's actually two types of trout uh, that are stocked. So brown and rainbow trout are stocked by Fish and Boat Commission. And it is Fish and Boat Commission, as was mentioned uh, earlier in the webinar, that regulates uh, the fishing rules in North Park Lake. And uh, we know what types of fish are in there based on their biologist report. Um, so what you're saying is um, really Fish and Boat Commission has done studies and determined how, what types of fish should be stocked. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. What type of fish are stocked and uh, what type are, what type live in there as well? Yeah. Um, is it catch and release only and do you need a license to fish? So you do need a license to fish in North Park and it's catch and release before trout season. Um, but all of that needs... Uh, all, all of that goes through and is regulated by Fish and Boat Commission. So if you have any questions specifically about fishing and licensing, uh, definitely reach out to the Fish and Boat Commission for those questions. Okay, and we have one question. Where is the riparian buffer? You can find the riparian buffer off of Pierce Mill Road and McKinney Road, and I can type that in the chat box. Uh, just keep a lookout for the North Park Dog Park. Yeah, it's also behind the, um, the park admin building. If you're familiar where that is. 
Um, any other particularly cool habitats or points of ecological interest in North Park that weren't highlighted? There are quite a few and I could spend hours um, and I would love to. Uh, in, in the future, we are going to be hosting more North Park specific history programs and probably webinars as well, given the current climate. And uh, stay up to date on that by count, checking out alligatorcounty.us backslash park programs. So I'm not going to spend the next three hours, although <laughs> I'd love to. Okay, on that note, um, I do want to make sure we have some time um, to get to Settler's Cabin. So um, if I didn't get to your question, if we have time at the end, I'll come back to them. Um, so we're going to move on to Settler's Cabin and um, talk about uh, a project that ACCD was um, kind of roughly involved with on a little bit on the peripheral. Um, it was um, monitoring AMD in Settlers Cabin Park. So in 2015, um, the Allegheny P County Parks Foundation requested assistance from the Trout Unlimited AMD Technical Assistance Program to look at the impacts of abandoned mine drainage um, to Pinkerton's Run, which is the stream that flows through Settlers Cabin Park. Uh, for anyone that's unfamiliar, AMD or abandoned mine drainage results from water that's been polluted by contact with mines, uh, specifically in Western Pennsylvania, it's coal mines. Uh, the most common form of abandoned mine drainage is acid mine drainage, uh, which is highly acidic water coming from the mines. Uh, so there's two things when you look at AMD that you really need to, to analyze for treatment. Uh, the first is the chemistry, so you need to know what's in there. And the second, you need to know um, how much flow is there. So that was kind of what we uh, assisted with through the summer of 2000, spring of 2015 through the spring of 2016. Uh, myself and typically an intern monitored flow monthly at eight sites uh, in the park along Pinkerton Run. And we sampled water quarterly with uh, Head and Environmental. It's a local uh, environmental consulting firm that specializes in AMD treatment design and re remediation. Um, so the, the data that we collected um, was ultimately used to prioritize those eight sites um, and we found that two were really most in need of treatment and those two um, as part of the process um, Head and Environmental had created kind of conceptual designs for those designs were modeled after the successful implementation of another treatment site in the area um, at the Pittsburgh Botanic Garden. They have a AMD treatment site at their woodland uh, garden exhibit. Um, so you see this picture, which was taken during construction because um, the AMD system is, it's called a drainable limestone bed. So this is actually underground. So you don't actually see that um, big pool there it's actually the trail goes right over it. So if you haven't seen it, I encourage you um, to visit the Botanic Garden, um, which was leased from Settlers Cabin Park. And currently those two sites that I mentioned are um, being pursued for funding through the Allegheny, by the Allegheny County Parks Foundation. So that's our um, project in Settlers Cabin Park. So I'm going to turn it back over to Elise and Deglin to give some more um, Settlers Cabin Park information. So we're just going to pull up our Settlers Cabin slides on the screen here. So Settlers Cabin Park is the largest regional park it is located um, out near the airport, right across from Settlers Ridge Shopping Center, and it's roughly around 1,600 acres. And it is named because of a log cabin that was found on the property. Archaeologists from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History helped to identify the origins of a 1780 log cabin um, on the property, which is now the Botanic Garden property um, but as Amy mentioned, the Botanic Garden leases land from Settlers Cabin Park, and I'll show you a map of exactly where their land is later. But the log cabin was originally built by the Walker brothers, Gabriel and Isaac, 
and they came here from Lancaster County. And they are the first people to have recorded um, legal claim to the land and they both served in the Revolutionary War and fought in the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, they were taken to Philadelphia and tried for treason because of that, but were later pardoned and returned home to their log cabin pictured here. Um, there is another log cabin that is about a mile east of this one that is not on the park property, but was also built uh, by one of the brothers. So this log cabin pictured is known as the Walker Ewing Glass House because the Walker brothers um, eventually married members of the Ewing family. They were a very prominent family in the area, which eventually married the Glass family. So their three names are connected to this cabin and the cabin that is one mile east um, is the Walker Ewing House. So their names are attached to both of the cabins here. And at some point in time, um, around the 1920s, the mineral rights of the Aryan Settlers Cabin were sold to the Pittsburgh Coal Company. And Settlers Cabin was deep mined in the 1920s and then surface mined in the 1940s, um, which relates to the acid mine drainage issues that we are seeing today. And the region was famous for its high output of shallow coal. Um, and there were a ton of abandoned, backfill, abandoned and backfilled mines when the county acquired the land. So they put some work into grading and reforesting the land um, before it was opened as a county park. And this park was opened on June 7th, 1969. And like I said, it is our largest regional park. It offers one of three wave pools that the county parks operate and the settlers cabin wave pool is the busiest wave pool that we have. It sees the most visitors every year. Um, they have a couple of other recreational features in the top left corner and there's a deck hockey rink next to the tennis courts and settlers cabin and the bottom left hand picture um, is an off leash dog park that we recently just opened a few months ago that is in the back corner of the park. And Settler's Cabin um, is a little bit different than some of our other parks because there are still some sort of wild, unexplored areas of the park that you can hike through. But the developed area where the shelters and roads are is only a small portion of the park. And there are a lot of valleys that have spring ephemerals in them. Um, the top left hand picture shows some ponds where there's actually beaver activity um, that can be hiked to. And the bottom left-hand picture is a small waterfall that Settler's Cabin is known for and is a very popular spot to hike to. The bottom right-hand picture is actually improvements that we have been working on um, with money from REI and FedEx. We have been doing trail improvements to the waterfall trail for the past year and a half or two years. And we just added the steps in the photo. So we did a lot of restoration plantings and added a split rail fence and those stairs um, to make the waterfall more accessible because um, the waterfall is kind of the must see feature of the park. And the Botanic Garden, as I mentioned, um, rents part of the park, uh, leases part of the park from us. And this is an image of the map from our trails website that Declan mentioned earlier. And there's a faint green line that distinguishes where the Botanic Garden land is versus the rest of the park. So kind of the bottom left-hand side of the park is leased by the Botanic Garden. Um, and then the top of the map shows where the park is and the different colors are, is the trail system in the park. So we have um, blue, red, green, yellow, and purple in Settler's Cabin and they're actually being reblazed now um, so that they are easier and we're making some loops out of them. And as I said, sort of the must-see feature in Settler's Cabin is that waterfall. A lot of people hike to Settler's Cabin so that they can see the waterfall. You can hike right down next to it. There's actually a picnic table there um, that you can sit and there are a couple of different trails that leave that area. So we are hoping to be able to continue to work on our trail improvements there um, and to be able to add some of those features like the stairs um, to some of the other sections of the park. But I definitely recommend 
checking out Settler's Cabin, hiking to some of the remote areas and looking at the wildlife there, but also hiking past the waterfall. It's a really fun feature to be able to see. I think if anybody has any questions um, about settlers or any of the projects um, that the conservation district has done there or the acid mine drainage, um, feel free to ask us and hopefully we will be able to answer them for you. Okay, I have one question. Where is the waterfall? So I will tell you, you can Google it. If you Google waterfall trail and settler's cabin, it'll take you to um, the trailhead parking lot, but it is next to where the off-leash dog park is. So it is kind of in the back corner of the park. There's a parking lot that is shared with the off-leash dog uh, park and the trailhead to the waterfall trail. You can park there and then you'll follow the green trail down to the waterfall. So you can download the county's trails app or go on the county's website um, and you can see where the green trail is and where you can park, but you can also Google it um, and you can see where the entrance to the trail is. Where are the other wave pools located aside from Settler's Cabin? There is a wave pool at Boyce Park, a wave pool at South Park, the wave pool at Settler's Cabin, and then North Park has the pool that Declan discussed, um, but it is not a wave pool. Uh, are there any trails that have these water features where you're able to creek walk? In Settler's Cabin Park or North Park, what kind of animals might you find in the waterfall pool? So several of our trails in our parks have um, what we call water crossings or creek crossings. Um, there are a couple other areas in Settler's Cabin if you follow the green trail where you'll go over um, different creek areas. Uh, sometimes we install big stones there so you can step over. Sometimes it's shallow enough that you can cross. I would suggest um, looking at that trails map online just so you can see the different areas where um, the trails cross over water, um, which will probably be a bridge, but more often than not, we try to use um, water crossings or creek crossings. And mostly um, macroinvertebrates is what you're gonna find in the waterfall pool and maybe even some salamanders. Um, there are definitely visitors that frequent the pools, so maybe not as many as you would find um, downstream and depending on the water quality. Uh, but those are kind of the, the ones that we see most often. Okay, I have a couple questions that we didn't get to for North Park. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing more about the history of the land. How, how did the U.S. get the land in order to gift it? And did you involve any tribal members who might have some memory of living on these lands and developing the planting plans? So there's a little bit more information about the depreciation lands. If you visit the depreciation lands museum or the um, Pennsylvania state website. So if you just Google de depreciation lands, um, there's quite a little bit out there, um, including an old historic map that shows you how it sort of formed a V uh, with the Ohio river and the Allegheny river. Um, and there uh, are some, some efforts to understand what was on the land. A lot of what we know actually comes from uh, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History doing archaeology projects on a place called uh, the Rocky Dell, which is right off of the Yellow Trail, which is named for Rachel Carson and extends from North Park to Harrison Hills. Um, so the Rocky Dell is one site and there's actually also a site that they'll, they might mention in the um, upcoming webinar about Boyce Park. And they did an archaeological dig in the 70s there as well. And they learned a little bit about the Monongahela people, which is where some of that information comes from as well. Cool. So um, that, that completes the questions that are currently in the chat box. Um, as we mentioned, we're going to send out a follow-up email probably tomorrow. Um, and that email will have um, some links to upcoming programming, including um, any registration you might want for the, the three remaining uh, webinars in this series, um, as well as some other um, presentations the parks uh, may be doing.
Uh, also in that email will be a survey. Uh, we appreciate your feedback uh, and any kind of uh, thing you might want to hear in the future. Uh, so we use those surveys to provide better programming for you guys. So uh, we hope that you will fill them out. Uh, other than that, thank you for listening and we hope to see you next week.